long to get to this point where, you know, fortunately we did have a, a 4-1 vote to move forward with looking at that proposal. But we know from the data that we have gathered and that we've discussed in previous meetings that overnight safe parking has about 100%. About 100% of those spots every night are taken. And we also know that about 30% of those spots are individuals who are seniors. And we need to be able to connect to more individuals that are not simply the caricature of homelessness that we're so used to. Because in this whole packet, I only see individuals 18 and over. I know for a fact in the city of Vista that we have a lot of individuals under the age of 18 who are experiencing homelessness in many different ways. And I think that we are not doing our responsible due diligence if we are not including that population as well. Even at a minimum, we should be looking at what the McKinney-Vento numbers are from Vista Unified School District. Because I know that, I, and I actually don't know what the numbers are at this point. I, I know when I was first elected back in 2018, I think it was over 3,000 individuals, right? So we have homelessness and housing insecurity is a, is a huge issue. And it will continue to get worse unless we provide housing that's affordable, we provide housing that is permanent and supportive for those who have a difficulty being able to care for themselves because we do have a responsibility to our community members. And we need to be able to connect with individuals who are currently not part of the strategic plan to address homelessness but are 100% experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity here in the city of Vista. So thank you, that's all I have to say for now. Um, and I look forward to just continuing to move the needle towards uh, a, a holistic approach that really is human to human, where we lead with compassion and a service to humanity. Thank you. Councilmember Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Sylvia and Amanda, for this report. Thanks for meeting with me uh, earlier in the week as well to kind of go over all these numbers and how funds were allocated and why some stuff was showing that it was expended and not expended and how we were going to use the funds. So I really appreciate all that information that you went over with us. Um, I did want to find out and just kind of note for the public, how many full-time social workers do we have boots on the ground in Vista between the County of San Diego and the City of Vista that are full-time social workers pounding the streets right now? We have one social worker and then the county offers one primarily in VISTA. However, it's not a VISTA specific social worker. So it would be a total of two. Okay. There also is a social worker through PATH that does a North County region. Mm -hmm. So that can also supplement support. But again, that's only one specifically to VISTA. That's our one VISTA that we have. And we have two others that are from outside agencies. That can come into VISTA, but it's not their... Okay. They're not designated specifically for okay. VISTA. No, and I know that we've spoken about that. The social workers are definitely the most effective tool that we have, the human-to-human -human contact, um, the success stories that you see in the report that we got where we actually have a family that was living under the bridge at Vista Village Drive off the 78, and we were able to transition them into a motel for 20 days, and then from that into an actual apartment as a husband and wife and a family. So there are real success stories and real good things happening here through the strategic plan to address homelessness. Um, I think Jim Riggenbach said it best. Props to you, Jim. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate. We also have a lot to improve. Uh, there's no one size fits all solution for homelessness. We have to have the no barrier. We have to have the, you know, uh, different types of, uh, you know, options that we have. Solutions for change is great. Operation for Hope is great. Uh, North County Lifeline is great. But also all of the beds that we provide and a permanent supportive housing model that we've all spoken about and we have an RFP out for, I think is a really important thing for the city of Vista. It's, uh, you know, going to be the, the end all be all as far as like Councilwoman Contreras said when it's transitional where do they go after that we just put them you know back and you know we need to get them 
into society, you know, producing and feeling real value, like they're giving back. And I think that through this plan and all of these different resources, we have the ability to do that. Um, I do want to thank the HEAL Network and Councilmember Melendez for writing your letter. I think looking at the five options or the five things that they want to implement in this, and I think you probably agree from a staff perspective, they're things that we're concentrating on. You know, we've talked about having individual rooms instead of the community, a uh, communal living um, option. We talked about, um, you know, inclusive shelter models for all people, families, women, um, also our social workers and social service programs that have proven successful. We want to spend more money on those. And then social workers um, are in the permanent supportive housing, I think, that we spoke about. So uh, I do think that this is a big, cohesive approach. I love having the two ladies on my left and the uh, two uh, people on my right here working with me because they bring two different approaches that I think together form the best outcome for the city of Vista. And we've put a lot of time and work into this. I know that you have as well. Um, one question that I had here was, do we actually have any type of dehumanizing language in our strategic plan? Like, do we have like goals that are worded that sound, um, you know, abrasive or inhumane per se? Have we had somebody look at that to make sure we're not putting any documentation out there that has any verbiage like that? We, that's a question we were just talking about when okay. that, that comment was made, and okay. so we'll definitely take a look at it to yeah. see what, I mean, it's a living document, so yeah. we're always willing to update and make changes and have another look at it. And that's why it's so important to have everybody like this on this council. That's why they're called blind spots, because we don't see them. They're blind spots. So I appreciate you guys checking that out. Appreciate you guys bringing that forward here. Uh, let's see. Public health. Let me just make sure I got all my notes here, because I am good to go. Safe parking. I understand we still have the RFP out for that, and we're working with the county on actual locations, or the county has locations. Have we had any update on that at all? or? We're looking at locations at this particular time. Okay. The RFPs have not been released for either the permanent supportive housing okay. or the safe parking, but that is coming. Okay, cool. So I want to make sure that we're doing what we're doing. And like uh, Councilman Contreras said, we've added a lot of um, additional items to this plan cohesively that I think are going to make a huge impact, and they're already making an impact. Uh, I did like that when you talked about the point in time count that you stated it was on the coldest night of the year, is, you know, those numbers to say we have 76 unsheltered uh, homeless residents in the city of Vista, you know, that's what was there that particular night, but I think we know that we have a growing population that definitely needs to be served, that we're working really hard uh, to try to serve. So I know this is a receive and file uh, item. I don't think there's any particular, um, you know, motion or anything that needs to to be made. Uh, there's no particular reallocation of funding. You're going to come back to us with any additional requests for funding on your effective programs and things? Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. I know that the community appreciate it. As a council member, I appreciate all the work that you do and all the updates, and I love hearing all the stories and this data that we got. I'm excited to dig into it. Thank you so much. Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to say, Mayor, I think the next item on our agenda might be of interest to those who came to hear about the uh, homelessness issue. Okay, um, Councilmember Melendez. Thank you. I just had a, one follow-up question. Thank you, Councilmember Green, for asking about the social workers that we have available to us. Um, so we have one social worker for Vista that's contracted through Exodus. One social worker available through the county. They work in Vista a lot, but they're not. You know, they don't have to be in Vista. And then um, we have a housing navigator as well. That's through Exodus, supporting them? Yes. Okay. And then um, could you just illustrate for us, because um, I'm a little confused about this, we have the Encampment Resolution Grant Fund, and what does that go to supplement? So does that mean we're getting an additional social worker in VISTA, or are their services going to be supplemented? So it's actually going to be two designated, two additional social workers, okay. so we'll have a total of three. Okay. plus an additional housing navigator, so that's two housing navigators, plus our very own enrollment, um, benefits enrollment person. Okay, right so now the county provides one. Okay, so the county provides one. Are we still going to be able to utilize that person? So in addition to the county social worker and benefits coordinator, the encampment resolution grant will secure us an additional benefits coordinator and an additional social worker. Two social workers. Two additional social workers. Okay. And that's great. I just wanted to be clear on that. And I want to also say that I'm really excited about um, furthering the benefits coordinator position because 
That role is awesome. It's um, you know all about the material benefits that people um, are you know eligible for and entitled to. Um, so. From my understanding, that role, the benefits coordinator, they go into the field and they do, uh, you know, outreach to individuals who may be eligible for public benefits, right? And um, when, you know, what does that look like for someone who is receiving that benefit? So our social worker has stated that that is one of the best resources that she's received from the county is actually the benefit enrollment person. It's really been able, she's been able to engage with people out in the field and then the enrollment person will be right there and kind of do their all their information and immediately get them enrolled in whatever general relief or any other programs that they have. So it's on the spot instead of making connection at a later time for them to be enrolled. So it's on the spot when awesome. someone is well, um, has an opportunity to speak with that person. I did want to note that the additional resources we're getting from the encampment resolution is specifically on that 24 acre lot of the Hacienda, the BPO area, because it was a grant that's specified for that region. So those two, those resources are not citywide, it's, um, it's to that specific location. However, it will free up our current social workers time to more do activities citywide. Awesome, and thank you again so much for helping secure that grant. I understand that City of Vista was the only city in the region to be awarded with it. So, great job, thank you so much. Okay, so that concludes our, oh, Councilmember Contreras, sorry. Sorry about that, I wasn't gonna say anything and then I was like, I do have one last question actually because um, I'm just curious, um, on the quarter four snapshot of services slash referrals, uh, there is a item on here, um, shower slash laundry, and it looks like four out of four uh, clients were able to be linked to that. Uh, is that... Is that in a specific location because they were referred to a particular shelter? And I'm curious about where that data came from because um, I, you know, if, if hi, personal hygiene is really important, right? So being able to link up to those services is critical. Um, and I don't see in this data that anybody rejected that, but I do see only four out of four so I'm just curious, I, and I believe our municipal code does not allow uh, for shower and laundry, um, which is why when we were discussing safe parking, I brought that up, because I, I really do think that we need to open up our municipal code uh, for these types of um, hygienic services. So we would, we would make an assumption of where that's at. I'd rather give you accurate information of sure. where those showers were located but it was something offered through our social worker and all this data is provided through our social worker of what referrals they provided. So that we can tell you, we can get exactly where those four shower locations were. Sure, that would be great. And I just wanna make a note that that, that is, uh, you know, possibly an additional strategy that we can utilize to one, you know, again, along with that topic of having a human to human connection, uh, being able to link someone to such a necessary resource um, you know, being able to wash your clothing and wash yourself is critical to the health and well-being, especially, you know, when we're looking at beyond physical health and we're looking at mental behavioral health. Um, I think that's an, a critical component. Um, and it, as illustrated in the data, uh, it could be potentially a very important strategy uh, for us to, to utilize uh, if the council uh, majority so chooses to open up our municipal code to uh, permit uh, shower and laundry. Thank you. That's all I have. I don't see <clears throat> I don't see anybody else. Any other comments? So that was kind of a receive and file. Um, and the next, actually, the next discussion is similar, would be similar to that. So our next discussion is the California Senate Bill 1338 Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Court Program, which is called the CARE Program. So Deputy Mayor Franklin asked for this item to be placed on the agenda, so I'm going to ask him to introduce the item. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, Governor Newsom has been talking about a reform to the Landrum and Petra Short uh, conservatorship process and 
particularly how uh, the mentally ill access that uh, process. And he has developed a proposal that he calls Care Court. And uh, several of our neighboring cities have already uh, passed resolutions in support. Uh, it's really aimed at allowing those who are too ill to understand uh, their, their illness prevents them from understanding that they would benefit from psychiatric treatment, uh, is to help them access the court system uh, so that they could receive a plan of treatment uh, as uh, in the governor's proposal here. Um, actually, before I get too deep into it, uh, since this item has been agendized, and I'm sure there's some members of the public here that would like to talk about it, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, why don't we, uh, before I finish my remarks, why don't we go to the public's comments? Okay. <clears throat> the first speaker will be Paul uh, Weber and then Jim Riggenbach. Good evening, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you for uh, agendizing this item. I think SB 1338 is an important piece of state legislation and I'm hoping that the council will support uh, this item. This is important legislation to address the challenges of the untreated and the unhoused. SB 1338 creates a civil process to help those experiencing untreated mental illness. The subpopulation of people experiencing homelessness that is increasing the greatest is the mentally ill and chemically abusers. And based on the Exodus report that we uh, identified a little earlier that's in your packet, uh, uh, the update considered earlier, about, I'm sorry, um, half of the offers to link those with mental illness to services and potential treatment refused. That is exactly the population that we're talking about that would benefit from uh, care courts and, S and the passage and implementation of SB 1338. Care courts are intended to assist those suffering with untreated mental illness to get the care they need. The current system in the state makes it easy to get sicker and sicker and hard to get treatment. Care courts is a step to reverse that so that treatment and pathways to stabilize and become easier, uh, becomes easier to access, I encourage you to support this item. One, one thing I wanna just uh, 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 mention while I've got time, uh, in my advocacy work, I, I know way too many uh, loved ones of people with serious mental illness who are uh, at their wits end because they can't get their loved ones the treatment they need. Oftentimes, uh, and it's not just in this county, but counties all up and down the state, uh, loved ones are encouraged to putting a, re putting a restraining order against their seriously mentally ill family member, uh, hoping, making them homeless, hoping that they commit a crime so that once they commit a crime, while in jail, they may access treatment. That is just egregious. And it's something that needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed through reform of the Landerman Petra Short Act. It needs to be fixed by the uh, elimination of the federal IMD exclusion. And, it, and, and I think SB 1338 in care courts is a good step to do that. We need to continue to have this conversation. And I appreciate uh, Council Member Franklin and this uh, council. Uh, I urge you to support uh, this item. Thank you. Jim Regenbach. Thank you. I hope to hear detailed plans on how this bill would be enacted. I hope to hear constructive criticism of the bill because there's likely a lot of holes in it. And when there's holes in a bill that involves involuntarily, involuntarily committing people, we should be concerned, especially at the local level. I hope to hear a realistic description about the number of people this will affect and the timeline for implement implementation, which is likely years. I've talked to professionals in the field who tell me that they can't even connect willing participants with the services and housing they need to succeed because there's not enough. But instead of immediately funding robust wraparound services and housing, there's this focus, uh, focus on conservatorships. 
The ironic thing is that if there were adequate services and housing, the need to involuntarily commit people would be much, much less. And this care court system is not going to work unless the current services and housing system gets major funding and focus. So why not fully fund services and housing first? Ultimately, being supportive of SB 1338 is different than being supportive of this resolution. Um, so some points and questions about the resolution itself. There's nothing in it that shows a commitment to increased and sustained funding, which is, I mean, it's dead if it doesn't have the funding. Um, care courts will be nothing more than criminalization until we expand services, which will take years. Also, it states that SB 1338 will, quote, help in the city's effort to help secure permanent housing. Please explain that. Also, the resolution states this is a new approach. I don't think involuntarily committing people is a new approach. I think it's an old approach with a history of problems. Acknowledging that would help avoid repeating mistakes. On the surface, it's pretty easy to support this, but our leaders need to go deep and design a system that works. Maybe a form of involuntary commitment is a piece, but there's so much more that's needed before going there. Please approach this with a critical eye. And Deputy Mayor brought up the two gentlemen who you highlighted on next door, who got into the hotel and then got kicked out for disruptive behavior. No, it was a different couple. Oh, okay, it's, it's hard to follow. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the services they were offered or that were available. It kind of sounds like you're gonna use them as an example of people that could be involuntary committed, committed through SB 1338. So maybe a little bit more information. Um, the guys that you did highlight on next door, maybe you could talk about how they were convinced to go to the hotel, why they eventually got kicked out of the hotel too, because I believe that's what happened. That's not what happened. Okay, well, I, I saw that guy in the street a couple weeks later. So anyway, just full information would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, that's, that's the end of our speakers, so do you? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm happy to address uh, the questions. Um, that is not what happened, and uh, you know, I'm not a psychiatric expert, I, I don't, uh, you know, and I wasn't there in the um, shelter and don't know the specific reasons uh, why the shelter did not work for those individuals, but the reality is, and I appreciate the question because brightly brightly underlines why we're talking about this subject tonight. Because for so many individuals, the shelter system fails, and that's a problem. Uh, Greg Angela told me recently, and he kind of he kind of spoke out of turn, and he corrected himself later uh, kind of formally, but he said, you know, a really low number of your referrals from VISTA uh, are successful. And he came back later, I saw him subsequently, in person and he said, you know, I, I misspoke and he followed up with our staff and he said, you know, I, I went back and looked at the numbers again and I was wrong. But the reality is, you know, when you have people who walk into a facility, they've made a choice uh, that they're at a place where they're ready to accept some help. Uh, those folks are honestly and com comparatively, they're very easy to help because they've come to a place a knowing place where they're ready to accept some services and want desperately to change uh, their circumstances. But for those individuals who are not fully there, who we talk into, who we convince, uh, who we encourage, who we persuade to accept the services that we're offering, uh, many of them are not at a place where they are gonna be ready uh, to change their circumstances because ultimately uh, it doesn't matter how many services we offer um, we could offer a, a room at the Ritz and a personal medical concierge, and, and there's some individuals who are not ready uh, to, I don't know why you shake your head at that. Uh, you know, we, I'm not being sarcastic. And, and this is, okay. I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm saying there are certain individuals that simply providing services, you know, I listen respectfully to you, and your behavior is disrespectful. So that's, that's fine. Um, you know, there was commentary earlier 
And there was commentary from the council. We talked about dehumanizing behavior, okay? Why do we have to dehumanize one another in this conversation? Why do we assume bad intentions on behalf of our neighbors and our colleagues? Why do we come to a place where we assume that other people in our community who are our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers and our family members, why do we look at them and we assume that they come from a place of bad intention? Uh, I think that's wrong. I think that's dehumanizing. I think trying to attack and tear people's dignity down is the wrong thing to do. Now, uh, Governor Newsom, uh, his staff here locally apologized that they were not able uh, to be with us this evening. They chose to be with the County uh, Board of Supervisors here in San Diego because tonight, uh, as we speak, uh, Chairman Nathan Fletcher and Vice Chair Nora Vargas uh, printed out for everybody, this is available on the County Board of Supervisors. It's a letter that's written and signed by both uh, Chairman uh, Nathan Fletcher and Supervisor Vargas. Uh, and it's, uh, their action is to direct the Chief Administrative Officer of the County, consistent with Board Policy M2, to advocate in support of the CARE Court framework in the form of Senate Bill 1338, or another legislative vehicle through a letter of support to the governor and through advocacy with state regulatory agencies. You all have this in front of you. This is uh, on page two. You can read the full thing. Um, I've also provided you with this press release from Governor Newsom, okay? Uh, Governor Newsom is asking for support for 1338. Now, what is the CARE Court agenda, the, the program that's been devised by the governor? Is it forcible treatment? No, it's not. You have the governor's proposal in front of you right here, and it outlines in its FAQs, this is not grabbing people up off the street and putting them into a conservatorship, putting them into a mental hospital. It is bringing someone before court, and it is devising a plan of treatment. Uh, now, it is, as said right here on page 11 to 35, uh, there is no Reese court hearing, uh, there is no forcible medication under the care court plan. Okay, so I, I hear those concerns. The reality is um, there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation. The Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution requires that if somebody goes forward into a conservatorship hearing, they have the right to be uh, represented by an attorney. Uh, you have the right under the Fifth Amendment to a jury trial. You have the right under California state law to be apprised in writing by the judge of your right to a jury trial. A unanimous jury verdict every 12 months is required to create a new conservatorship. You have the right under the Lanterman Petrus Short Act to a patient rights advocate a lay person to help you understand and navigate the court system to spend as much time with you as is necessary. You have the right under the LPS law to have a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, to make a diagnosis. So we're not diagnosing people with people, uh, med with folks who have less than sufficient credentials. But all of that is somewhat irrelevant to the conversation tonight, because we're not here to talk about uh, putting people into an LPS conservatorship. We're talking about the governor's care court proposal, which has been maligned and uh, wrongly lumped into the same category. The reality is this is a precursor. This is a step towards helping folks who, as the governor in his materials points out, uh, lack the ability and insight to make decisions about their own medical care. Um, I appreciate Paul uh, Webster introducing me to several family members whose children are suffering from severe mental illness, uh, some of whom have suffered some of the worst fates, uh, like starting a fire and being sentenced to a decade in prison for starting a fire in an encampment. Uh, one of the notes I made here, jail and prison are not the place to offer psychiatric treatment to those who are severely mentally ill. The governor's proposal is aimed at helping those who are amongst the most severely mentally ill, who suffer with severe schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. We know one thing. Throughout the state of California, what we are doing is failing. The problem is growing explosively. 
what we are doing is not working. We need, and I support, and I commend the governor for taking a novel approach, for trying to do something. I mean, we all know the definition of insanity is trying the same thing again and again and expecting a different result, and that is what doing more of the same is. Now, I am convicted to each and every one of the programs that we have adopted under the Homelessness Strategic Plan. I believe it is essential that we first can say in genuine honesty uh, to every single person that's living on our streets, we have offered the bed to sleep in, we have offered the meal to eat, we have offered the mental services, we have offered the physical health services, we have offered the transportation services, and now each of us on this council and every person that works at this city can look at every resident in this city and say that all of those services are being actively and daily offered. And we have a report in front of us tonight that outlines the number of times and the number of different times that each individual has been offered those services. Some individuals have been offered services 20 separate times. What will we do when the approach that has been tried for a long time, for decades, fails? We need to think about a new approach. Now, Todd Gloria, the Democrat mayor of the city of San Diego, has come out in favor of this. Uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, who is a, uh, a mental health professional, the mayor of El Cajon, recently adopted a very similar uh, proposal on which our proposal tonight is modeled. The wording in the proposal is very simple. It does not get into extreme complexity. It simply does what the governor asked us to do in his press release, in his uh, public statement, uh, which is uh, of only a few days ago. It asked for support for 1338. The entire structure of the bill here uh, in the governor's proposal is laid out in exquisite detail. Uh, it is not a forcible uh, medical treatment. It is a court-ordered program of treatment that includes service providers named in the uh, treatment program who will provide the services, the government's duty is to build this uh, treatment plan and to bring it before the judge with the patient and to marry the, the patient uh, with the treatment plan. So yes, I agree, we need more wraparound services, we need more uh, supportive housing. No one is going to be put into a treatment plan under the care court proposal without the services that they need as an individual being identified first. We are not, the, the proposal here that the governor has put out is a sound proposal because it is not one that goes out and says, you have to do this, this, and this without identifying the services. We all agree that in certain places there are deficits of services, in others, and our numbers clearly demonstrate the fact that in some instances there are a glut of services uh, and they're not being accepted. Not everyone, in fact, we hope it's a very small percentage of the homeless public is unable to accept services and successfully get rehoused because they're severe mental illness prevents them from being housing ready. There may be significant deficiencies, and I'm sure that there are, but the deficiencies with our current status quo, our current approach of allowing severely mentally ill people to live in the street and of telling their family members, I'm sorry, maybe if they get locked into jail, maybe if they break into somebody's house, Maybe if they get in a fight and injure one of our deputies, maybe then we can get them some treatment in a jail or prison setting. I mean, I think we all agree that's not the place to provide treatment. We want to be able to provide treatment to people before we get to that place. So I understand that there's uh, an, a desire to talk about an alternative. I've read that alternative. I appreciate uh, the author submitting it. Uh, it takes away the, the core function of our resolution, which is to authorize the, the city staff. Uh, you know, one of the things that we authorized in the Homelessness Strategic Plan was a legislative advocacy component. We really have done maybe one letter, uh, supported maybe one policy, 
and I, I can't even off the top of my hand, head tell you what that was. I'm sure Patrick can, it's not important that the fact is, we said and we acknowledge the fact that there are significant deficiencies in state law and in federal law that are stopping us as a municipality from solving this problem. It isn't all right here with us, as evidenced by the fact that this, the county is tonight addressing this subject. And uh, you know this is being discussed in the halls of the Assembly and of Congress. We need to be active in the conversation that's taking place in all of the governments above us in trying to advocate for the policies that we are implementing on the ground that we see that are failures that need to be changed. We need to stand up and we need to actively engage. That's one thing that we said we were gonna do. We haven't done it yet. This is a significant policy proposal that is hugely bipartisan. Uh, it is not coming from one side or the other. It, there is a breadth of public support for this. And I hope that this council will adopt. You know, I, I would take the language uh, of, the, of the county, of Supervisor uh, Fletcher and Vargas, if I couldn't get my proposal. But this all, other alternative that strips out all support for SB 1338 to me is unacceptable and would not win my support. Thank you very much. Okay, and, and um, this, this, this packet that they put in our thing it has answers to all of the questions throughout, throughout it. And I, there's 1.5 billion for behavioral health bridge housing funding. So there is, there is money in there for some, for some kind of bridge house funding for this program. So um, I'll go on to the speakers here and we have the next one is uh, Councilmember Contreras. Thank you so much. I actually want to thank uh, Deputy Mayor Franklin for bringing this forward and for your comment saying that you would support the County Board of Supervisors letter, which actually my alternative uh, resolution is almost a carbon, car carbon, carbon copy of that letter. Um, if you've read through my alternative, it actually highlights. And the reason that I like the County Board of Supervisors, the direction that they took, versus the resolution that we have before, has, before us brought forward by Deputy Mayor Franklin is simply that I do think that it's too simple of a resolution that doesn't speak to the gaps in SB 1338. Um, you know, I, I will say that it doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or, or a Republican or independent or Green Party or American independent, whatever you are, uh, whoever you are, I'm not just going to trust you. Um, I'm going to need to do some research. And in looking at uh, SB 1338, you know, we're trying to, let's, let's also look at the focus. Okay, so Care Court is looking to uh, target individuals that um, are experiencing uh, psychotic uh, behavioral mental health issues along with substance use uh, disorder and particularly those individuals who uh, currently don't have shelter. The total is estimated anywhere between seven to 12,000. Uh, in the state of California, it's estimated that we have 161,000 individuals that are experiencing homelessness. So, you know, um, although this is a new direction, and I think it is really important that we have conversations about what's not working and what needs to be addressed. I don't believe that this, the SB 1338, um, and maybe someone can correct either me or, or Deputy Mayor uh, Franklin, but I don't believe that it actually is addressing any of the issues with LPS. Um, in fact, I think that the governor himself said, you know, that's a third rail. No one wants to touch that in politics, so they're carving out this new uh, proposal. Now, the issue that I see um, and that the county sees as well, if you read their letter, um, they do offer criticisms because, again, the care court is going to fall on the shoulders of the county, and we already don't have enough funding for the resources that we currently have. So there needs to be a commitment and a push, an advocacy for creating stable funding to be able to increase the workforce, right? To be able 
to have the housing that we need because SB 1338 is silent on housing. It does not, a, a court ordered plan may say that you need housing, but it is not going to identify the housing for the individual. And if we're speaking about an individual who is not able to care for themselves medically, how are they able then to follow successfully a court ordered plan that would include housing? Uh, so I think we really have to be realistic, and we're in a place right now where this legislation is being crafted. So I do believe that we can come together and state, hey, you know what? I do believe that we need to go, we need to create new systems. We need to be able to go in a, in a new direction so that we can help individuals who currently cannot help themselves but hey, state, you're going to need to give us funding. You're going to need to have a dedicated commitment to beyond $1.5 billion in, in support in transitional housing. We need permanent housing because we don't want people to cycle through um, care court over and over again because then we are doing the same thing, right? We're, I also agree with Deputy Mayor Franklin, you know, the the incarceration is not the place that we should be helping individuals. In fact, we just have way too much incarceration in this country in general. I think we have like 4% of the population. We have like 20 or 25% um, of the world's incarcerated individuals. And then when we do look at, um, you know, why there's certain organizations like Human Rights Watch, the ACLU, Disability Rights California, Western Center on Law and Poverty, why they have opposition letters against SB 1338, you know, that needs to be taken into account too. I, you know, I, I, I got to make a comparison that I think it's really unusual that it took, you know, four to five meetings to pass a single use plastic reduction ordinance and that it's going to take more than one meeting if we even have a majority to pass smoke-free uh, outdoor dining. But in one meeting, we can say, hey, you know what? Even though there's not an actual proposed budget that has details about how care court's going to work and even though, you know, it, it provides um, a path where if an individual is unsuccessful with their court-ordered plan, they can be referred uh, to a conservatorship, you know, I think we really have to be critical about those things. And as soon as I read something that says, we're not going to take your rights away, I'm like, wait, why'd you have to put that in the document anyways, right? Why, why would that have to be stated? So then when I'm digging deeper, I'm like, okay, well, um, the subtext is that if an individual does not complete care court, then what's the alternative? Well, if there's nowhere suitable in the community for them to continue their treatment, then they will be most likely referred to a conservatorship. So the idea of conservatorship being not germane to SB 1338, I don't believe that is true. And so in reading what the county was putting forward, I actually, I really, really, really think that they have a better framework because they are saying, hey, you know what? We do gotta do something different. We absolutely need to try something different, but here are the concerns and this is what we want to see from the state. And I think that, um, you know, the alternative resolution that I'm providing captures, and it's almost word for word, I only have a, a few uh, words in there that are my own. Um, I think it captures what we're trying to do, which is tell the state, we agree that a, something, a new approach needs to happen, but we also know that we want to be successful. And in order to be successful, we need to be able to address some of the gaps in the current legislation. So, um, you know, I, again, I'm thankful that we're having this conversation. I think it's really important for cities and counties to have this conversation, uh, but we, we can't be so quick 
to pass something uh, because we want to be able to tell voters that we're doing something, we have to also be really critical about what we're passing and ensure that we are doing our best as a council to advocate when we see gaps in legislation that we are saying, hey, we, we kind of agree with this. Um, with that, uh, I, I would put a motion forward that we accept the alternative resolution that I brought forward. Um, and I'll go ahead and um, I do want to read it for the record because I think it addresses uh, what we're trying to do tonight while also being critical. So I'm going to start uh, after the, the findings. Uh, in March 2022, California Governor Newsom introduced a policy framework that seeks to assist people living with untreated mental health and substance use disorders. The policy framework, the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Care Court, is a court-ordered plan that connects a person with 24 months of case management and services. These services include a public defender, clinical support services, and a trained supporter, as well as a housing plan. The collaborative participation of local municipalities is necessary for the successful implementation of Care Court in San Diego County. In the city of Vista, the care court framework could play an important role in helping people with very specific needs access treatment. However, certain concerns would need to be addressed in order to successfully implement care court. As care court is a, pre is a uh, proposed strategy to help those who are experiencing homelessness and substance use disorders, housing is a critical component. Without providing necessary housing, the care court treatment provided will likely be unsuccessful. An unsuccessful participant of care court is one who fails to follow the court ordered plan. In failing to follow the plan, there is a presumption that there are no suitable community alternatives and that a conservatorship under the Lanterman Petrus Short LPS Act may be warranted. Care court as currently written, housing is not guaranteed. Without housing, an individual experiencing homelessness could have difficulty successfully participating in the care court plan. The eligibility criteria for care court participation must be carefully crafted to target the population in need by clearly defining eligibility in consultation with behavioral health experts. The program will avoid the severe unintended consequence of involving people in the court system who are not in crisis. Additionally, carefully defining eligibility will ensure that those in need receive the full benefit of care court rather than encumbering the program with unintended recipients. As you see that uh, the alternative resolution is very close to what the county uh, was proposing. Uh, so I do uh, make the motion that we accept the alternative resolution that I just read. Thank you. Councilmember Melendez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I would second that motion. I appreciate the uh, conversation and that this alternative resolution offers more feedback and um, and criticism where we really do need to be um, concerned with how this would roll out from the state of California. I know that a lot of us don't want to see, um, you know, we talk a lot about unfunded mandates and what the state of California, um, you know, enforces within our local municipalities. And I do uh, take high regard to, to those criticisms. So I would second your motion. Um, but I also want to be able to share my perspective that I um, am critical of CARE Court and I do not support the CARE Court framework as it is currently presented in SB 3, uh, 1338. And the primary basis of my dissent is that I do not agree with restricting an individual's autonomy and the right to make decisions for their own life on the basis of a mental health diagnosis. Within the, uh, 
the uh, previous resolution that was presented, um, there's a claim that participants in care court framework will be offered services and entered into a legal process without taking their rights away. This is not true. The care court framework does not offer voluntary programs. The care court framework is a legally mandated framework that offers mandated programming. Participants in the care court do not have a choice if they want to particip participate in the framework and its programs or not. The care court framework functions by distinguishing individuals as unable to make their own medical or personal private decisions. By being diagnosed with a psychotic disorder and being referred by a family member, law enforcement officer, or other person with the belief that the program will be of benefit to you, you can be mandated to participate in the program. Then, for 12 to 24 months, you would be obligated to successfully complete an individualized care plan. If you do not prove to be successful or you do not comply with the plan, you may be subject to further conservatorship. So what is the program? And we do see outlined in the bill a lot of different resources. Um, you know, there's a whole section on the care plan. So I just want to, I'm not going to read it all for you, but I'm concerned about people's ability to successfully complete the care plan when one of the elements that is included in the care plan is housing, right? Um, these are housing resources funded through um, No Place Like Home, the Encampment Resolution Program, Project Home Key, Transitional Housing Program, HUD, um, all these different programs, all right? There's a whole paragraph of them. But these are programs that I'm not an expert in all the programs offered through the state and through the counties and through the cities, but these are commonly utilized housing resources available through county and city administered programs. So my concern is how does this list of you know, housing provisions that's being offered through the care plan, how does that differ from the resources that are currently available to our community and people are already accessing through our community. So that was one of the big concerns. I know that there's a proposed um, amount of $1.5 billion that's going to go to appropriate transitional housing for, and prioritized for individuals who are part of this care plan. Um, what is that transitional housing? What does appropriate mean? We've had a lot of discussions about these topics as a council, you know? So I think that it would really be to our highest benefit to know where people are going to live. Um, you know, people who are about to be um, obligated to participate in this framework um, are experiencing conditions that can be cured with housing. So where is the housing? We need real homes for people to live in. How much of this $1.5 billion for housing comes to VISTA, and are we ready as a municipality to dedicate the space in our community for people that are being required to comply with the care plan? I appreciate this alternative resolution because I think it's going to pass at the state. And you know what? I don't stand with Democrats on this. This is probably the most political thing that I'll say. I'm a registered Democrat, and I've had a lot of conversations with my fellow Democrats over the past couple days about this topic, and I do not stand with a lot of my fellow Democrats on this. I think that they are, uh, they've missed the plot. They have gone into a direction of, you know, ultimately what is going to happen is scapegoating a group of people rather than actually fighting for housing as a human right, which is something that I believe. So I do not stand with Democrats on this issue. This solution does little to resolve the material, real needs of people who are suffering on the streets and working people who need affordable housing. Everyone deserves a place to call home, and I do believe housing is a human right. Without guaranteed, dignified housing for the individuals enrolled and forced into this kind of framework, we're guaranteeing their failure. I don't, I mean, I can share my experience. I used to work for a program um, that was funded under Prop 47. Y'all know Prop 47. 
right? It took a, a, a bunch of felony charges and it turned them into misdemeanors. And a huge cost savings was experienced by the state of California because they were no longer housing people through incarceration. Instead, the individuals had misdemeanors and they were just kind of in the public. And a lot of these charges and these crimes, you know, we see the, the recidivism of these crimes, such as automobile theft, um, you know, and other like, you know, similar, you know, smaller crimes that are deemed that way. In this program, the way it was administered was, you know, really opened my eyes and motivated me to run for public office because at the end of the day, even though people were willingly participating in this program, right? It wasn't, it wasn't involuntary, it was a voluntary program, like the first of its kind. And even though people were willing to participate in the program, there were all these resources provided for the program, there was not sufficient housing. It just, there wasn't sufficient housing. I don't know what else to say. We need more housing. And I, I know that not everybody on this council will believe with me that housing is a human right and believe that a lot of the conditions that folks are experiencing on the street can be resolved with housing, but I genuinely, truly believe that that is the case. And the thing that we need to do different is to invest in publicly funded housing. Historically, it's worked in the past. America has an incredible history of publicly funded housing that could really resolve a lot of these challenges. And so for the people that are in these terrible, lonely experiences on the street, where their human mind is vulnerable to delusions and psychotic attacks, I understand that they need more support. And I am 100% in agreement with that. I just think that the support needs to ha start with their material reality and their housing and that they deserve to have a home. And we know that a lot of those, you know, permanent supportive housing programs and long-term programs that aim to house with care are going to be the most successful. So I don't stand with Democrats on this. I think they lost the plot. I don't know where this came from. I think it's completely missing the point of what we could be, you know, using our pub, you know, public dollars for. We don't even know how much this is going to cost. I think it's, it's not within my value system to endorse something and support something without even knowing how much it's really going to cost us. So that's a, a lot of criticisms I can offer to y'all tonight. I'm glad we're having this conversation because it's an opportunity for us to share our values, you know, and, and assert our beliefs. Um, and my belief is that uh, we got to do better than this. But I do support the alternative resolution because it offers a critique and it does advocate for housing. Because you know what? Damn it, it's going to pass at the state of California. So we might as well make sure that our municipality has the funding and the resources to make sure that the folks who are in our community, who will be funneled into this non-voluntary program, they got to be a part of it if they are referred. I mean, I don't know how, how else to say that it's coercive, it's not voluntary. You cannot choose. You have to participate. And because people are being forced to participate in something, it is our ethical duty to ensure that they're successful and make sure that they have the housing for it. So thank you for the time. Councilmember Green. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm glad that we're talking about this too. I think it's a great item to talk about and I appreciate Councilwoman Contreras' alternative resolution and I also appreciate Deputy Mayor Franklin bringing this forward. Uh, we talk a lot about lived experience and uh, when it comes to lived experience and mental illness, I have a lot of lived experience with mental illness. Um, I actually feel like my sister and my mom could have benefited from a program like this. Um, my sister Kitty Ann Perrine uh, actually passed away a little over three years ago and uh, she had a mental break and she did have a house so I don't think that uh, you know housing can cure obviously all types of mental illness but I think what we're talking about here is when somebody can't actually make decisions for themselves that are gonna you know keep them around it would be great if somebody could have acted on her behalf and got her the help that she needed because uh, she ended up being checked in on a 5150 to Palomar she broke out 
She hid in the, in the, the freaking woods for two days before we found her, blasted all over KUSI, San Diego, uh, you know, Union Tribune, looking for my sister. Where's my sister? Have you seen my sister? And uh, we eventually found her. We got her back. We got her on meds. Uh, we found out she was lying about some different conditions that she said she had, lying to her husband for years. Her husband left her. Um, you know, they lost their house, and she ended up going from that mental instability to a drug reliability, and she she ended up um, passing away um, about a year after the 5150 incidents at Palomar Hospital. And there was no real um, you know, help from a government standpoint. As an elected official, I couldn't get her the help that she needed. I didn't have a care corps. I didn't have anybody that knew how to work the system who could help my sister. And you know, 